fact, the price of gold is not going up. The value of our money is going down. And if it's already gone down this much in the past, imagine how much more it's going to go down in the future when we have much bigger deficits, when we're going to be printing even more money. The Fed's balance sheet is going to explode uh, over the next four years because it's already going, I mean, the, the, the deficits are already rising and we haven't even officially started um, the recession. But the economic reality is that governments can't stimulate an economy. There's nothing they can do. They can sedate an economy. They can screw an economy up, but they can't improve it. Now, one thing that they can do, but it doesn't really count, is they can stop harming an economy that they've harmed. So they can undo things that they have already done. That is the only thing they can do. Soaring debt remains a major concern as the U.S. national debt load is now past $35.3 trillion dollars the Congressional Budget Office sees national debt rising from 99% of GDP this year to 122% in 2034, surpassing its previous high of 106% of GDP set in 1946. Ratings agency Moody warned this week that U.S. fiscal health will deteriorate regardless of who wins the November presidential election in the absence of meaningful steps to reduce the fiscal deficit, rein in new borrowing, and slow the rise in interest expense. More than half of the essay sentiment survey's respondents, 54.1%, see steep spending cuts as the most realistic way to immediately address the budget deficit. Notably, 25.6% picked changing the tax code. Economist Peter Schiff argues that governments cannot genuinely stimulate an economy. They can only sedate or disrupt it. If cutting taxes can benefit the economy, it suggests that taxes were detrimental to it initially. However, Schiff notes that the government often shies away from accepting responsibility for that harm. The federal government's deficit has reached $7.3 billion thus far in this fiscal year. According to the Finance Department's latest fiscal monitor, this figure marks a significant increase compared to a $1.2 billion deficit during the same period last year, from April to July. During these four months, revenues rose by $14.9 billion, reflecting a 10.2% increase from April to July, 2023. However, program expenses, excluding net actuarial losses, surged by $17.5 billion, or 13.5%, as the federal government allocated more funds for programs and transfers to provinces and territories. Additionally, public debt charges increased by $4.2 billion, or 28.8%, largely due to rising interest rates. Schiff stresses that merely cutting taxes without concurrently reducing government spending does not effectively stimulate the economy. He points out that the real burden on the economy stems from government spending, which siphons resources away from the private sector. Ultimately, Schiff contends that government stimulus is a misnomer. Instead, it functions more like a sedative. Let's delve into the video to gain further insights. Before we begin, Consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the bell icon to stay updated with the latest content. All these governments, the U.S. government, Europe, Japan, everybody says that the government needs to stimulate the economy, right? When the economy is in trouble, we need the government to help it out with some kind of stimulus. And the stimulus usually involves uh, cutting taxes or, um, or, or spending more money on something. But the economic reality is that governments can't stimulate an economy. There's nothing they can do. They can sedate an economy. They can screw an economy up, but they can't improve it. Now, one thing that they can do, but it doesn't really count, is that they can stop harming an economy that they've harmed. So they can undo things that they have already done. And the government comes over and, and puts 50 pounds of weights in this guy's backpack and now says, now go run the race. Well, obviously, the guy's not going to run as fast with 50 pounds on his back. Now, let's say the government says, hey, let's stimulate this runner a little bit. And the government comes up and removes 20 pounds of weight. So now he's only got 30 pounds of weight. And now he's running faster. And now the government claims credit. You see, look what we did. We stimulated this guy uh, by taking off 20 pounds. It's like, yeah, but who put the 20 pounds there in the first place? There's 50 pounds of government weight holding this guy back, right? So if there was never any weights on his back at all, the guy would to run a lot faster. But now the government wouldn't be able to stimulate him by taking some of the weights away. So all the government can do is they impose taxes, they impose regulations to slow down the economy. And then when they, they want to stimulate the economy, they undo some of that. Right? They, they, they take away some of the taxes. But when they say that, hey, we need tax cuts to stimulate the economy, that's an admission that the tax cuts are hurting the economy, right? Because if you can help the economy by lowering taxes, doesn't that mean you hurt the economy? 
with the taxes? Of course, right? But they never want to do that. They don't want to accept responsibility for hurting the economy. They don't want responsibility for putting all these weights right, in the runner's backpack, but they want to get all the credit when they, when they take the weights off. But here's the problem. You don't stimulate an economy by cutting taxes if you don't cut spending, because the real weight on the economy is the spending. Those are the bricks that are in the, the backpack of the runner. It's not the taxes, it's the spending. That is the cost that the private sector has to bear. It's not how much the government taxes, but how much the government spent. Because what it's spending, it's taking from the private sector. And the private sector has to absorb it. One way or the other. The government can honestly borrow the money, but that crowds out uh, private investment. If the government borrows the money, well, that's money a businessman can't borrow to invest in plant equipment, right? So if the government borrows it, it crowds out somebody else, or it also drives up interest rates. Now, if they borrow from the Fed, well, then they just print the money. And so now we have inflation, right? And now the, the, the economy has to bear that burden because now prices go up. So there is no uh, government stimulus. There's just a government sedative. Now, I guess the only thing that governments can actually do, there's, there's one thing that governments can do that helps an economy. And that is establish a rule of law, you know, establish uh, private property, courts, contracts, right? These are all the basics though. The final update on US economic growth for the second quarter revealed that the economy expanded at a solid annual rate of 3.0%, and there are no significant indicators of a downturn. However, weak economic data, including a disappointing US consumer confidence index and sluggish manufacturing activity, has fueled expectations for further easing by the Federal Reserve. Interestingly, there is a paradox in the labor market. While employers are reducing hiring and unemployment rates are rising, new jobless claims are trending downward. Additionally, the dollar has fallen by 5% from its June peak as markets reacted to the anticipated interest rate cut by the Federal Reserve last week. Peter Schiff believes that the economy is on the brink of a significant downturn. He argues that the strong dollar previously helped reduce inflation, but as the dollar weakens, inflation is set to increase. Despite his concerns about the American economy, Schiff identifies potential opportunities within his investment strategy, especially in gold stocks and emerging markets, as he prepares for a challenging year ahead. Now let's redirect our attention to a video. The dollar, I think, is going to crack. Oh yeah, because it was the strong dollar that brought inflation down. It's the weak dollar that's going to bring inflation up, right? Because as the dollar goes down on foreign exchange, all our imports become a lot more expensive and commodities, which are sold in dollars, become a lot more expensive. So it wasn't the rate cut hikes that brought inflation down. It was the effect those rate hikes had on the dollar. Well, now the rate cuts are having the opposite effect on the dollar. The dollar is falling. And so consumer prices are going to be rising. So I think we can crack um, 90 and that means 2025 is going to be a resurgent year for inflation. We could end up with a higher high than 9% on a year-over-year -year inflation rate, especially oil. Oil could be the huge gainer. I, I mean, I'm surprised that oil is as cheap as it is because, again, it's never been this cheap. So it's not going to stay this cheap. It's going to go up. It's going to bounce. And when the dollar goes down, it's really going to go up. And so we're going to have an explosion in inflation next year as the economy is in recession. And in fact, if the economy wasn't weak before inflation picked up, higher inflation will just weaken it more because it saps the consumer of their purchasing power. Everything now costs more money. And so they can't buy as much because everything costs more. And, and so the economy gets a lot weaker and everything kind of hits the fan. And, and so I think that's the year that we're going to kill it in the, in the in the gold stocks, foreign stocks, in the emerging market stocks. I mean, I, it's going to be a tough year for America. I mean, I'm not happy about that. Um, but I think it's going to be a good year for for my investment strategy. And so, you know, if I, if I can't stop this bad thing from happening, it's better to make money from it than to lose money, right? Because it's going to happen regardless. The government now, you know, they want to vilify the grocers. Oh, and blame the grocery stores for r rising food prices, right? You guys are greedy grocers. You're gouging your, your, your customers. That's why we have inflation. They're going to blame the speculators. When the dollar crashes and gold goes through the roof, it's the gold speculators that did this. You know, we got to punish them. We got to cap them. We need windfalls, profit taxes. We need exchange 
exchange controls, all that's going to happen. But before it happens, I think we're going to make a whole hell of a lot of money. The value of our money is going down. And if it's already gone down this much in the past, imagine how much more it's going to go down in the future when we have much bigger deficits. The Fed's balance sheet is going to explode uh, over the next four years because it's already going I mean, the, the deficits are already rising and we haven't even officially started um, the recession. As the new fiscal year for the U.S. government commences on October 1st, funding remains a significant source of contention among lawmakers. Recently, a stopgap bill was passed to fund government agencies through December 20th, effectively delaying decisions until after the presidential election. Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump and his running mate, Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio, have expressed their support for a weaker dollar to enhance domestic manufacturing. With inflation on the minds of voters leading up to the November election, the consequences of a weaker dollar are substantial for personal finances and investment strategies alike. What role do you think economic issues will play in the upcoming presidential election, especially regarding inflation and currency value? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. If you found this content helpful, give it a thumbs up, and remember to subscribe to stay updated. Thank you for being a part of this journey with us.